Thanks for having us, Jennifer, and, and, and just like to quickly introduce Envirostream before we start the, the problem that is batteries. But Envirostream is the first and only lithium ion battery um, recycler in the country. There is a couple of lead acid battery recycling companies, so that's when we talk about other recyclers. There's, there's a large network of lead acid battery recycling and there's some alkaline recycling done in the country, but we're the only um, company currently recycling lithium ion batteries. So, Envirostream, oh, now my slides aren't working, okay. So we founded, or I founded Envirostream in Melbourne in 2017, growing out of a, a problem that we had in the, in the recycling business, um, which were batteries. You know, we had a, a couple of tonne of batteries and we needed to move them somewhere and no one would want them. And, and as a recycler, it was really against our ethos, if you like, to dump them into landfill. At the time, it wasn't illegal or frowned upon to move batteries to landfill, but we started to to look at a process on how to extract the metals and then find companies that would um, be able to reuse those metals or the mixture of metals that we found in batteries. So we started doing that as a full-time business in 2017. Uh, we really looked at the, the management of batteries in Australia over and above anything else. It's quite difficult to import batteries or, you know, and that sort of thing. So there, there's a large enough volume in, in Australia to have a, have a good business. The issue is the collection. Uh, we currently employ 11 people and we processed last year 380 tonne or 380,000 kilos of batteries in Melbourne. So trying to put size to that is always a bit of an issue, but that's equivalent to 15 million little AA batteries. So we, to try and describe that it is, is it's hard, but it's certainly a growing problem because it's not only about the batteries that are here today, it's the batteries that are, that are coming. And if we think about what a battery is or how we look at batteries, up until recently, you know, you would, you would think of a battery, what you would use in a remote control, what you would use in a torch, and it kind of, some people understood there was batteries in cars, but you know, a lot of people don't know how to service cars, so they don't, they don't assume that they have to deal with that. So these were the batteries people were dealing with. And now what we're seeing is people really understand that power tools, electronic equipment, cars, solar panels, you know, they're all to do with batteries and portable power. And this is real, a really growing industry in each one of those um, five categories. Alkaline, the non-rechargeable AA type of batteries will, will still stay. You know, they've certainly got a use um, and they're cheap and they, they still last quite a long time. Power tools is just an amazing growing industry with nearly all of the um, corded equipment changing over to runoff batteries and IT equipment, the convenience and, and what that offer is us for a, a day, you know, daily life is, is really amazing. So it's just growing, growing, growing. Um, so it doesn't sound bad. It all sounds great. You know, we've got these new portable devices that they don't run on petrol. They don't run, they don't have smoke coming out of them. So what's, you know, what's the issue? They're convenient. They're giving us, they're saving us a lot of time. You know, is that not reward enough for having a product that's so great? Um, surely can't have anything bad. But unfortunately, you know, it, it does take some resources to make these things. And the way we're using them is just going to cause a whole lot of problem at the end of their life. With it. And that's the key is batteries certainly have a life. And, and it's, it's not a long, long life in a lot of cases. Some only two or three years. Electric bikes are not doing... You know, they don't have a long lifespan because people are using them a lot and they're charging, discharging. Cars should last quite a long time if, if the mileage is good. You don't have to recharge and discharge. Um, but, you know, it's, it's something that we have to consider. So um, where we see some issues in Australia especially is that um, currently there's only less than 10% of the waste is not going to landfill. So it is collected for recycling. Um, batteries especially lead acid, um, the lithium batteries, they contain some nasty chemicals. Um, nickel cadmium is another heavy metal. So there's some really hazardous chemicals and metals that are used in batteries. Batteries can, can cause fire when in landfill. And I guess that's where 
even in the curbside collection, there's some issues because once you start compressing that rubbish um, from the curbside collection in those trucks, you're actually forcing the batteries to be crushed. And, and that's the issue. It's not, not that the issue is just a battery decides to catch fire. The issue is in those trucks on the curbside collection, they're getting, you know, they're getting compacted so they can fit lots of rubbish in. So that's the issue there. Um, and batteries take up space in landfill. I think this is a, just a simple point, but if, if there's only a certain amount of landfill sites that we have, and they've got to be managed very well for the future so we can build on top of them again and reclaim that land, then why not save that space for material that doesn't have a home or, or there's no way to recycle or is perfectly fine to, to put into the land and it will biodegrade and it will not cause any issues. So taking up space is, seems simple, but it's, it's a problem. Um, and the battery volume is just going to be massive. So we've got to have a solution for reusing it. Um, resources in the batteries are just wasted if we don't recycle them. Recycling is not free. So sometimes this is a bit of a hurdle because everyone just says, ah, you, you know, you, you're getting the metals out. Surely that's worth some, you know, enough money to pay for the whole thing. And the reality is there's lots of steps involved in recycling from somewhere to a bin, you know, just the cost of a bin to then someone to go and empty that bin to then someone drive that material down to the local recycler for that recycler to, you know, sort it into the material stream. There's a, there's a lot of small jobs that add up to, need to be paid for from that commodity stream of material and collection and drop-off points <laughs> try and point out three in your local area there's there's just not they're just not widely accept, accessible so that's a big difference so what we're trying to point out here is the volume of growth and, and again it's really hard to communicate this but we're, we're trying to just show it in, in simple graph terms but if we look at the batteries today, for this is for lithium batteries only. We're, we're talking about 3 million kilos. So about 3,000 tonnes are imported to Australia 2020. So that's including all the laptops and mobile phones and, and power tools and electric vehicles that arrive today. But in 10 years' time, they're predicting that to 50 times more batteries. So 150 million batteries, kilos of batteries will be coming into into the country so and if you put a timeline against that for the waste arising you're looking that 10 15 years after that or 5 10 sorry after that you're going to have to deal with that as a waste stream so it's just incredible that we can be dealing with 3 million now going to 150 million in just 10 years time because that's how big the industry is becoming and how quick it's growing the the concern with that is not just the waste. The concern is around, so I'm not sure if my video is in, in front of the issues, but the, the natural resources that supply that industry are the next concern. So if you're looking at the resources needed to manufacture those batteries is, another, is the next sort of slide, is where you've got cobalt demands at the moment for making lithium ion, high powered lithium ion batteries. You're looking at um, 61 tonne, 61,000 tonnes in 2018, growing to 360,000 tonnes in, in 2028. So again, in 10 years time, it's more than doubled, more than tripled. So it's six times greater. It's just phenomenal how quick it's growing. And this is just one battery type. So if, if there was another chemistry developed that's better for cars or something, it will change, but at this stage, the chemistry that's working contains cobalt um, and this is what needs to be supplied. The other issue here is this is one of the resources required to make batteries. There, we've got a slide further down, but up to 16 different types of resources that make batteries. So it's, it's, it's a bit concerning. So to give you an idea what volume looks like, this, that's a lot of batteries. Everyone goes, hey, that's a lot of batteries. That's only 20 kilos of battery. So it's just, it shows the mix that, that you've got to deal with. Um, and we're just trying to show a little bit of, of what um, 150 million kilos of batteries might look like if, if that's just 20 ton, 20 kilos, sorry. That's just 20 kilos. The next um, 
issue is, is you know, volume is, is one thing, weight by volume is one thing, but the sheer number of brands that um, batteries are imported into Australia, sort of, it's very hard to point a finger and say, this is a BP or a Shell problem. You know, you've got two or three oil companies that you can recognise. Great, very easy to say it's, it's their fault and it's, this is their issue and they've got to help fix it. But in the battery space, you have down the right hand side of the screen, there's so many different types that people, you know, assume that they're the battery types. Well, there's, there's under each one of those, there's then alkaline that's made up of three or four different chemistries. There's lead acid that are three or four different chemistries. Every one has a, has a separate um, issue. And then there's so many retailers and so many brands. So, you know, this is really a common a consumer problem more than a brand problem. If you, if you look at the demand on applications, the demand on battery use, it, it really becomes a, an ownership issue for consumers, not so many brands. So, so we really just trying to point the point that, you know, it doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter what part of the country you're in. It's, it's an Australian problem that's growing. Um, this is happening everywhere in the world too, but if we shouldn't expect that we can just export this and someone else will fix it, you know? So we really take, taking, taking a bit of a, an opportunity, I suppose, and also a front front foot approach to this problem is we would like to see Australia deal with its own waste. You know, we've got to build local community um, drop-off points. We've got to build better management in the recycling um, system to make sure that people know when things are recycled in Australia, there is no runoff to the local creek. There is no air pollution. There is no material that doesn't get accounted for. And, and that there's a lot of regulation in Australia around that. And that's why we'd like to see batteries just stay here and we can fix it if they don't export these sort of things. We can build a recycling industry. So trying to now move into a few more positive messages. We've, we've really um, made some good inroads with, with some companies. Some companies are now really starting to, to come on board and say, yep, no, we need to fix this problem. That, that's a huge issue growing. These retail companies are reaping the rewards a little bit, reaping, sorry, not reaping, uh, reaping the rewards a little bit of the, the growth industry, especially in the power tool market. So Bunnings, they're offering a good return system, office works, uh, total tools. The local councils are now coming on board with Victoria having a, a landfill ban for batteries. You're not allowed to drop them into the landfill. Um, but Queensland, WA, New South Wales, South Australia, there is um, local council drop off and Battery World nationally runs a campaign for recycling batteries. So it's, there's starting to be more and more of a network in the public domain, I suppose, for the batteries. Um, then what we've started with is some initiatives with um, business to business type of initiatives. So rent to kill initial, they service the air freshening sprays in the, in the toilets, in different, you know, facility facilities all over the place. So what they do in their service vehicles, they have a container that, is safe to carry batteries in their vehicles. So the, the service technicians will change batteries out and put them in a, a collection unit and then drop them back at a depot, which we collect and recycle those batteries. AG Coombs is a company that does, again, facility management, fire systems, alarm systems. They do all the repair work while their technicians are on site. They put those batteries in a container, which they then take back to their depot. And it's working really well. And hotels, are, are, we've got a couple of hotels in Melbourne um, running the same type of in-house servicing. They don't offer it to their, you know, to the guests, but the in-house service team with all the exit lights they have, all the remote controls they change over, it's a phenomenal amount of batteries that just in each hotel gets used every day. Um, hospitals are the same. So there's some really good initiatives um, started to avoid landfilling if we're with batteries. So about a bit more about what we can do. So the, the technology that we use and the technology that is available to, to recycle material out of batteries is already available today. And, and that's what's also really exciting about where we are in this space is we've, we have developed a lot of ways to use this technology, but the technology is available now. So quick little science lesson is this is the elemental table that you're probably all familiar with um, somewhere along the line in your life is 
lists all the elements that are that are available that are known to you know known to the earth so if you look at batteries the scary fact is there's 16 different elements that we've tested in batteries um, and some of them are chemical some of them are, are you know man-made chemicals with lithium salts and hexafluoride phosphates and all these crazy names but the 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 majority that um, can be recycled very easily are metal. Um, they can come in powder forms, foil forms, in the casing of batteries, but ultimately this is the mixture of elements that they use to make batteries. There's a lot of material that there's a lot of demand on for, a, for a, the life of a battery. So if we take those materials and, and take the opportunity to, to avoid landfill, we can really build a, a good industry and, and develop a, you know, a strong backbone for the battery industry too, is, that, is those materials can be reused to make batteries. That's also exciting. So they're not, with, you can't break something down further than its elemental value. So if you've got, um, steel and you break it down to iron you know that that's it it can't go any it can't change into something else so once you've got it at that level um you can reuse it to make new batteries to make new metals to make new alloys whatever you may need to, to do so that flows into the the message of a circular economy very nicely it um by supplying you know the, those resources back into a manufacturing industry we really believe that's that's as a recycler that's the ultimate goal so if we can collaborate with manufacturers with consumers to drop off and be responsible for the waste um, and we can then work out the process to avoid that landfill and recover as much resource as we can out of each item we deal with we then can work with manufacturers to work out how clean we have to get it how, what size we have to make it into and all of these type of things. So it can be reused in, in different manufacturing industries. And that's where the value in recycling is. Talking very quickly, I know, so sorry if it's moving through. So the, the EnviroStream solution, it, we've come up with different um, collection units because there's some that go into, you know, in hardware suppliers, into office spaces, into service um, companies. So we've now got a standard unit that can offer a flexible solution to all those type of industries where we take all the battery types they use and we sort them in our warehouse. So in the processing we have, um, rather than go through all the different steps, we're able to process different chemistry types. So this is also unique to EnviroStream. We, we in-house process lithium batteries, uh, nickel metal hydride batteries, which are the two main rechargeable consumer batteries, and then uh, the alkaline batteries as well. So that way we're seeing that as the main household batteries that are getting dropped off in, the, in these collection units. So that's where we're developing our volumes, you know, and our flow through our factory on that. But, in short, our process is, is mechanical separation. So we actually shred the batteries um, to different levels of sizes. So here you can see some granulated copper, some granulated aluminium, um, some plastic that's larger because you, you have to break it down in stages, and then some black dust, which is the cathode lithium material that works in the, in the new style of batteries. So it would be nice to say we we did everything alone and, and you know, we're so clever and, and all the rest of it. But I think it's really important to understand that it, this just doesn't happen easily. So there's, there's a lot of networking and a lot of skills that EnviroStream are, are levering from other companies. Lithium Australia is now bought into EnviroStream because they have a a lot of chemical expertise and also mining interest in the lithium space. So it was a, it was a natural fit for them to be interested in the products we have. Um, VSPC are a cathode maker, which is a company that you, they make the black powder that you saw um, to be used in coin cell, um, button cell applications and lithium ion battery applications. So they're, they're experts in what the material has to become to be, be reused, so we make sure our recycled product matches those demands. Monash Uni, Swinburne, um, 
in CSIRO and HRL are labs that we use for different types of testing to understand what our material is doing through our processes. And Close the Loop, uh, uh, a great recycling company as well. I don't know if, if many of you would have heard of them, but that, they're very active with the Downer campaign for reusing the roads, um, sorry, plastic reused into roads. So they make a toner um, out of printer cartridges that goes to road paving, but they also take our plastics product um, and reuse that as well, which is a great outcome for our pla the plastics out of batteries are quite mixed and they can't be just reused as a clean um, stream for plastic manufacture. And we've, you know, we've got good support from um, the Australian division with um, Austrade. So they've helped link us to companies in Japan, into Korea and, and really help, you know, look at the international markets for us and sustainability Victoria. We like to recognize that, that, you know, they've been quite active in, certainly with collection sites and, and helping to fund our activities as well. So the reason why, you know, recycling is, is so important. Um, someone's mined this product, whether it's just lithium or one of the other 16 elements out of the ground, if someone's had to, to dig that up. And if you look at the purity that it's in the ground, it's, it's really a concern because you hear the wonderful stories about what they make, the steel from BHP or the lithium from um, Kwinana in WA, but if it comes out of seawater or the, even the oceanic crust, it's at two parts per million. So that means out of, that is a very big number, but you're only keeping two parts out of that million parts to be used as lithium. So what happens to the rest is always, is always a concern on how they behave with the rest of that material. And sometimes it's useful. It, it, this lithium can sometimes be a byproduct of what they're digging for. But um, with batteries, it's at forty thousand to seventy thousand parts per million. So the the exciting thing with batteries is the other parts in that million are also products we can recycle. So just to give you an understanding, it, it's really a waste to throw this away. Even even with the arguments that oh batteries aren't hazardous when they're dead and all the rest of it it doesn't matter that they're hazardous or not. It's just the purity of the metals and the components that are in these batteries is just so high that it shouldn't be wasted. So what we're advocating for and really pushing, you know, is we've got to get better at collecting, you know, at urban mining and, um, Clo closing the loop and circular economies are, are so important, but the, for recycling, if the consumer link to recycling doesn't work, then it just goes as waste. It, it, there's no other way to do it. There's some reuse that can happen, but for me, that still happens in the in the consumer part of the circle, and and we really we really have to build that collection network for for this to be a success and. While we've got companies like Bunnings and Officeworks and LG Chem, who are a big battery manufacturer, um, Milwaukee, who are a large power tool manufacturer, we still need more. You know, there, there's no government um, incentive for collection. It just has to be, at the moment, consumer driven. And unless consumers and brands and business take responsibility for that, um, you know, and really it's responsibility how to, you get such good convenience um, out of this portable power. Why does it just get thrown away? You know, we should be a bit more responsible on things. And, and that seems, that message is getting through, I think, and we're starting to see a larger battery collection. But if, if it doesn't work, there will be a, what they call a stewardship or a, or a EPR, which is extended product uh, producer responsibility. And it becomes like a container deposit scheme. So for every battery that, um, people buy, there will be a, a levy put on top of it and that levy will then pay for the recycling. So we'd like to see that people can be responsible without that threat of a container deposit or a battery deposit um, because ultimately then you're paying more or you're still paying for it regardless. So we'd like to see some businesses take more responsibility and, and join our network of collection. So the, the process for us is, is really simple. It, it, we're trying to make it um, you know, very convenient and very simple to, to recycle batteries is, is our main goal. We'd like to, to see 
battery recycling really aid to reduce the impact of, of dependence on natural resources, build a, a really strong recycling industry alongside the battery industry. So when people do have questions of where does my solar panel go or my energy storage from home go, companies can really say, you know what, it goes here and this is what happens and then it goes back to, to make new batteries or back to make new energy storage or power tools or electric vehicles and that sort of thing. So one of the big other steps we're looking for in, in the recycling industry is, is really to work back with the design and manufacturing of batteries because the, the more reliance they have on nasty chemicals and, and heavy metals, it really makes the recycling dangerous for the staff and you know really bad for the environment. So sometimes when batteries are, are spruced as the solution and they're going to be the new power of everything, we just have to consider what, um, what happens at the end of life because it's certainly a concern for our industry. So I, in short, I, um, I can talk about batteries for a very long time, but I, th I think I've, I've talked a little bit too fast this evening, but um, we just like to thank Jennifer and the team for putting this together today. And hopefully there's some questions that people have because we find it really interesting and we're really pushing for this to, to be something that people need and, and want to have happen. And we believe it's, it's a good outcome. So we'd just like to say thanks to, Eco World and Jennifer um, for hosting today and hopefully it was of interest to listen to me talk. Um, but yeah, I don't know if Jennifer's there or... I'm here and I'm yes. fascinating, Andrew, so... That's okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, what you do, I can't speak for the rest. Um, yeah. I see there's a few questions there if you'd like to have a look. So how do... Yep. Um, down the bottom of your screen, you'll see um, a Q&A. Um, All right, so do I stop sharing my screen first? Uh, you can if you like. If it's up to oh, you. You'll, you'll be able to see them either way. Okay, hang on. You might find it easier to stop, yeah. Yeah, I'll just... Well, I'll stop that share because otherwise the camera says more. Yeah. Okay, so... You see, there's five Q and A. Five. There's five questions. Oh, uh, yep, yep. Oh, great. Yes, if you click on that, um, you can see it, um, but it's not going to obscure your screen for anyone else. They can't see it. Ah, uh, okay. So there's a two. So the top question is actually off off battery topic for a second, but is is it possible or viable to stockpile solar panels until recycling can occur? So. It's always a little bit dangerous, you know. Stockpiling is is such a concern for um for everybody. If if there turns out that there's a chemical in solar panels that we haven't quite analysed or, or found out that they're there, and if there's a large stockpile, the potential for leaching of those chemicals is bad. I think with solar panels, you know, it does. Everybody's pretty got a pretty good understanding of what's um, gone into them to manufacture them. There's no there's no liquids and, and things like that, that that have been used so there are some companies looking at exactly that they are looking at um, renting large land land sites for that um, so I think some things yes some things definitely you wouldn't want to be stockpiling batteries waiting for a solution you know because of the, the leaching that can happen and the danger of having that so the next question is how do we use so many batteries and how many batteries get tossed without being used it's a good question. You know, it's really simple. Is I think how do we use so many batteries? It is they're so convenient and they're in so many different devices. I was driving here this afternoon, and then there's a bicycle bicycle helmet now with lights all around the back. You know, it has to be a battery in there, and there is batteries in absolutely everything from watches to to smartphones to to cars. You know, it's going crazy. Um, and then, sorry. Jennifer, did you shut the question down? The, the, there is a lot of the, the concern around battery safety, you may have heard, you know, with, with drop off points and things, is people do throw new batteries away because they're, they've been in the shelf for quite a while and they're not sure if they're working or not working. So sometimes it's just easier to buy a new one, especially for a hearing aid or, or for a watch battery. You know, there's the button cell batteries, we're finding that they are quite a lot that are still in good conditions that get thrown away and, and they're the, 
they're the batteries we're most concerned about because when they're fully charged and if they come in contact with another battery that can touch both terminals at the same time, um, they do heat up and, and can cause an issue. So that one. So we'd like the answer to this too, but why don't the businesses who send batteries offshore send them to us? So the issue becomes the, the it's value. You know, people will pay for lithium batteries as a, a gamble to be reused. So you, if you wanted to, you could sell um, your old laptop battery because there might be six or seven cells in that battery and, and one of those cells could be broken and the whole battery pack fails. Um, but you can, Pull that battery pack apart and reuse that that um, those other five cells that may still work. So the issue for us is we don't pay for batteries at the moment, and some overseas companies do. If you export batteries, you're supposed to get a hazardous waste export permit, um, but there is only one or two. You can yeah, it's quite easy. It's out in the public domain. There there is really no viable option for exporting batteries it just shouldn't happen so a lot of it happens illegally where do batteries go offshore and what happens to them uh, you know if we're looking at seven percent of batteries getting recycled in australia that means 93 percent is either going to landfill or to offshore processing so a lot of batteries are going to landfill there's no question there's a lot of batteries still attached to devices so if you've got an old laptop and you sell that laptop to a company who then sells it on to another company that has a chance to go overseas. So there's a lot of batteries that are still in devices that get reused, which is not so bad, right? But unfortunately, then what happens to that end of life? It's not um, a concern for the Australian public. They've sold it, it's moved on, and it doesn't seem to be. The, the issue is the batteries that, that are dead and that get dropped off at it supermarkets or warehouses where they do have battery recycling. A lot of those batteries that go overseas, if they don't work and they can't be reused, there's nothing to say that those are being processed to recover the metals because if they don't have the value for reuse, there's an, again, a high value, a higher chance that those batteries are being dumped in another country, which is no good. So Andrew, can I just chase that point down for a minute? Um, yeah. And please, I, I understand there's some delicacy often around these questions. Yeah. Um, but um, let me show you. I, I just um, so it sounds like you know where they go and um, what happens to them. How do we? I'm sure people would be appalled. I mean, it's no different to the plastic issue, is it? Except it's worse conceivably. So how yeah. do we get? A, and, and, and I think one of the things that's really come, been very clear today is um, if we want change, um, if we really want change, then there's a big push around grassroots change. Yeah. So, um, and, and, you know, governments and regulators will do what they're going to do. But the reality is that there is a real shift in the mood at a grassroots level. Yep. So I guess I, I, I put it to you, what, what can we do? I mean... You clearly know. I'm not saying tell us or whatever, but yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's like the um, the guy, some guys um, who recycle um, uh, turn sorry um, fabrics back into cellulose were the ones that told me that op shops get basically paid to send a percentage of their yeah. um, stuff to landfill, but they didn't want to be seen saying it in public either. So I, I don't get what the problem is. I mean, it's appalling. Well, yeah, it's, appalling. it's appalling and it just comes down to you know it's economics it is if you collect batteries and someone wants to look we openly charge nothing to take lithium batteries There's, you know that's free that's a free service it's the alkaline batteries and that we do charge 25 cents a kilo but the issues with that 25 cents is that's double well in in queensland for example you pay 35 dollars a ton for, bat for material to go to landfill. And so you're either gonna pay for a thousand kilos with us, two and a half thousand dollars or $35. So in Queensland, what are you gonna do? You're gonna go, I've got to ship it to Victoria. I've got to pay them two and a half thousand dollars to recycle it for me, or I can dump it for $35. No petrol, no nothing, no transport costs. I'm going for $35 every day. 
Which so, is Queensland ended up with the waste problem it's now got, of course. Yeah, well, and now people are even from New South Wales are saying, I can go to New, I can go to Queensland for 35 bucks or I can go to Victoria for two and a half grand. So, you know, it's a real problem and it, and it's, it comes down to economics and that's the simple one. If you look at um, the reuse market, if you've got a battery pack, probably have one on the desk somewhere, but you know, if you, if you have a, a mobile phone and it's got a cell, a one cell battery, the rest of the phone is no good. Someone will buy that phone, pull the battery out and reuse it um, if the rest of the phone is dead. But the problem is that they'll pay, you know, maybe $5 for that phone, hoping that the components will work. We'll take that whole phone for nothing and we'll recycle the components. And we may be only able to get around two dollars, you know, three dollars after we process absolutely all of the all the material. Um, so we we've got a lot of expense to produce that that money under the commodities, but give it to us for nothing or get five dollars and the risk is gone to someone else. Maybe that cell doesn't work, but you got paid five dollars, so who cares? <laughs> And unfortunately, that's the that's the game that we're in, and and it's very competitive too. So, you know, if we take batteries for nothing and someone else is charging, they don't like that either. So they're saying, well, how do we pay for our infrastructure? So they have to look for a revenue stream somehow, and that's the problem. Right. You still didn't tell me where they go. <laughs> <laughs> well, they go all over the place. So the you know, to, to say we know exactly where they go, we don't. Um, there's a lot of lead acid battery recycling done in the country. And you can earn, if you were out there collecting batteries, you can earn four or $5 a battery, drop it off to your local scrap metal dealer. Then, then the problem is they have to sell it to someone who recycles it. So there's only two com companies in the country that's, that recycle them. So they, they get looked at quite badly because they, they control the pricing or everyone presumes they control the pricing. But... They have to break those batteries. They have to melt those batteries. They have to make a lead ingot to sell to a market, which is also competitive. So their lead price goes up and down. So their secondhand price of batteries go up and down. Alternatively, you export that battery to someone in Indonesia or in the Philippines. Uh -huh. or yes. <laughs> yeah. so, you know that, but that's the lead acid battery industry and it's shocking. So, okay. and, acid there's lead and there's so many problems for the environment in those batteries and unfortunately you know to do the right thing you're supposed to get an export permit to do the right thing you wouldn't be so worried about the dollar value you would be more worried about the you know the environmental impact but it just doesn't happen because there's too many people trying to to make money off recycling and and it's it's tough so they yeah can you see um, a point in the future? Um, Biobag, Scott Morton this morning said, he, he emphatically said, and um, I, I could get everyone to raise their hand and heard him say it because yeah. I was astounded, that he believes within three years that there'll be a full compostable plastic revolution in supermarkets. Completely. Um, that yep. plastic bags in supermarkets will be completely compostable. Now, supermarkets don't want that, but it's a consumer-driven um, point. Yes. So I'm reading a question that came in. Oh, just, um, you can answer yeah. that question first if you like. I mean, my, my question is, um, is how, how do you see change evolving, I guess, then? Yeah, so and it is consumer-driven. And, and that, well, it's, it's twofold. You've got to... There has to be a ban on export. There has to be a, a line in the sand that says, you know what, it, it maybe cause a short-term problem if we said nothing like this can be exported. Um, it will give the chance for mining companies, for other companies to get involved in recycling because there is a value there, um, but not when it's so hard to control. And, and, and that's the issue with that, that control of, and a guarantee that you're going to get product. That's the difficult part. So that's why we really want to, start owning a bit of the collection space because without product coming in the door we could have the best you know the the state-of-the-art um recycling plant but without a feed you've got no you've got no revenue so um okay so i've got a question here um looking at the growth curve i'm so glad you're working on this do our mining companies have a vested interest in using your rural materials rather than recycling uh, 
<laughs> so sorry, we're using new raw materials rather than recycling. So this is 100% they do because they that's their job, right, is to, to dig out raw material out of the ground and turn it into a product is exactly what they do. So, you know, I think we'd see a certainly we'd certainly see a different recycling industry if if um, some of the big players want it in because they've got the know-how. It's actually without, you know, the, the processes we use are straight out of the mining industry. There's no question. You know, the leaching of material to in acid is, is exactly the same to extract different commodities. Um, so if they, if they knew the value, well, they know the value of the material, but the issue is trying to collect it. You know, the volume of, of natural resources in Australia is massive and it's, it's easy to, once you've found it, you know what you're dealing with. If you dig that dirt for 100 years or 30 years, it's the same process and it's right in front of you. If you try and collect batteries and you've got to drive to Darwin or to Queensland or New South Wales from Victoria, you know, it's difficult. It's difficult. And there's a lot of rules and, and costs to that. That's, that's uncontrollable. James, one of the questions that came in for this session was about um, batteries um, catching fire. So yep. I don't, I, it's probably it'd be great if you could cover it. So it's this notion that um, there's somehow batteries, if you transport them, I'm not sure how people think that you can have one in a phone and then suddenly when you transport it, it catches fire, but some, or in a toy or something like that. But, but yes. there is, what are the circumstances around which it, they might, because I think when you mix batteries, there's some potential. Is there, or how does it happen? Yeah, so there's a lot of there is a lot of factors that that are different to when it's you know attached to a mobile phone or a power tool and, and things. And it, the the issue is um, was covered in one of those questions around how do you know if they're new batteries or old batteries or or how many people throw away old batteries or new batteries. So the the issue is if you've got, I think the easiest way to describe it is always that nine volt battery with the two terminals on top. If you throw that in a bin, um, you know, those two terminals are sitting up nice and proud. And if another battery lands on top, you've made the circuit. So you've got a positive and a negative and you've made the circuit if the other battery gets on top. And if that battery is fully charged, um, it can quite easily catch on, for, it, it create a lot of heat. The alkaline batteries don't just combust like, like a lithium battery because it doesn't have the energy inside it. Um, the, the other issue is the crushing. So if you've got large collection containers, so if you're looking at a 200 litre drum or a, or a wheelie bin, if you put batteries in that, it actually weighs double that. So if, you've got a, if you can handle 200 litres of, of batteries, that's actually weighs 400 kilos. So the weight of it gets very heavy. So if you've got a, a brand new lithium battery sitting on the bottom of that pack, and it could be a, a flat type of battery that when the other batteries fall, it starts to bend. And as soon as it bends, it, it shorts out internally and then that'll catch on fire. And, and that's really the problem with curbside collection and putting batteries in your curbside waste. As soon as it gets in that compacting truck, even if, so an old battery from your power tool, from your laptop will never fully discharge. So if they fully discharge, they can't be recharged. So the issue is that the battery management system always maintains some level of capacity in that battery or charge in that battery. So even if it's down at 20%, that battery is still live. So when it gets to a compactor or, or a curbside collection system, that's the most hazardous. And, that, and same, if it makes it through that system and it didn't go on fire, then it gets to a waste transfer uh, landfill site. There'll be large compacting machinery to compact the ground they'll catch fire then. You're on mute. You're on mute. <laughs> well, we're all still learning this technology. I've been it all day. <laughs> I'm losing it. <laughs> um, so the issue, okay, I get so So from a collection perspective, it's not small amounts of batteries that's a problem. It's, um, it's basically them being crushed or connecting in the, in the wrong way. Yeah, well, it still could be a small um, amount of batteries collected because it could still be the button cells that are, are large and the button cells are the small circular batteries. Mm -hmm. So the issues with those is they can quite easily get through the, the terminals and the guards that are, that are there. 
um, so they could sit inside the battery terminals and, and short the battery out. So it doesn't matter. You could be unlucky. It could be five or six batteries. It could be a ton of batteries. Um, but there's some good material. And talking about wool as a as a sustainable product with Jane before is we've actually working with a company. I've got some here, but as an insulation for fire with the wool. Yes. And so we're working. Um, to put that in our collection units and to make little bags out of, so people can, you know, if you're in that retail space especially, there's a lot of nerves around um, battery collection. So we're we're working with um, companies to prevent that fire risk. You know, it it will manage that risk. So there there is a chance. I think in America, uh, they had two incidences last year, but there's 24,000 collection sites across the states that participate in their battery program. And they did have two two large truck fires with batteries, and now they have all their boxes insulated with a similar product like that. Right. Okay. Yes, it's tempting to say there was only two, but I guess that's too too many, isn't it? In all fairness. Yeah, it becomes a risk over you know what the the hazard is versus the the chance of it happening. The risk is still very high, you know, and risk versus reward, I guess, is the is the thing, and it's it's too hard. Um. So last one. Um. If, if um, only three to seven percent of batteries get collected, how are you going to get them? That's a lot of batteries and it's a growing pile. So, yeah. I mean, and I'm just as bad, like I'm pointing to where mine are. So. Yes. <laughs> um, and I'm sure everyone is the same. Um, yeah. What can people do to get them to you? Because clearly we don't. Yeah, well, this, is, this is the big question and, it, and it's sort of why it becomes down a bit of a sales spill in the recycling is we really need companies to get on board with that collection because everybody feels a little bit guilty now you know it has it has switched you know people are thinking before they throw things away it's not now just about a, a landfill price in queensland versus you know victoria consumers are understanding that they should be a bit more responsible whether it's a, an old shirt and it needs to be recycled or it's um old shoes we're seeing products you know collection points for old shoes now too um so things are changing but we need collection sites for batteries they should they shouldn't be mixed with other material. If there was water in there, if there was chemicals put inside a battery collection unit, there'll be fires all over the place. And, you know, if, if heavier things, bricks got thrown in on top of a battery, they're just, it's just dangerous. So that part of it, if nothing else we should think of, let alone if we mix it with the rest of the curbside, how do the poor people at the recycling centres that do the curbside collection sort it out? Yeah. The one, are... um, like we talked about mm, Biome in Brisbane who collect, um, as do a lot, you know, there's quite a few um, uh, outbound stores and um, uh, outdoor places around Australia who collect the TerraCycle. So there's definitely a mood amongst retailers um, and different businesses, just businesses, to, yeah. to um, put a box out. Um, so maybe that's a path we could um, help you go down because um, and there's people here too um, who I'm sure um, know people that would glad. Yeah, that would be great, and and that's the key to success, right? So at, at the moment we're you know we're investing heavily and and trying to work out the the problem still and it's exciting, but it's not um, it's not sustainable with the volume we have. We really have to lift that volume tenfold. We need to sort of get three or four thousand tons a year to make this business um, a real success. Well, even just to start to become, you know, successful. So we're at 380 last year. So, you know, we've got a long way to go and, and without that collection. And, and it's hard. We've tried to lobby brands, but you, you look at that wall of batteries and it's daunting because there's just, there's one or two brands people recognise like Energizer Duracell, but they don't make the worst type of batteries. So they sort of say, well, ours aren't that bad. <laughs> Why should we pay? You know, it's really, really difficult. Oh, guys. Someone's yeah. asked you a question uh, in the Q&A about it. 10 cents. Yeah, so, oh, so we covered this a little bit earlier. So, it, yeah, if people don't do anything, so the, the part of the waste strategy for the government um, federally is batteries were, and this is kind of why we picked batteries a few years ago too, is, is batteries were marked as a, as a hazard, as top 10 hazards in, you know, paint was one, tyres was another. Um, but batteries was marked fairly early on um, because they don't want to see stockpiles of batteries and they don't want to see batteries going to landfill. So, Batteries were marked for a product stewardship, uh, which means there will be a fee on top of batteries if if the industry doesn't sort it out itself. So yeah. let us batteries don't have it um, because they the industry sorted that out. Um, 
and they uh, recycled at a high 97% or something briquette recycled. So the, the issue is if, if Australia doesn't get better, then probably 25, 30%, the government will put a, a regulated, regulated fee on top. And it's looking like for each AA battery, they're talking four cents. Right. So mm-hmm. of a pack of 20 batteries, you'll be paying an extra couple of dollars per pack. They're already cheap enough. Um, certainly, and paintback's been an amazing one. Yep, so paintback yeah, is exactly the same, right? So every litre of paint has a fee and it's a stewardship. Okay. So, yep, so there'll be that. Um, Andrew, sorry, I should um, have just mentioned James Bartle from um, Outbound Denim has arrived. Hopefully yep. James, are you still there? Oh, here he is. I am. Um, James. Hello, um, James. James is, a, uh, James is a late entrant to the day. Um, a popular one, I might add, but a late entrant to the day. Um, so I just thought I'd um, uh, say hi and, um, and welcome. Yes. Hey, um, yeah, thank you. James. Hopefully, if no one was here by five o'clock, it's going to struggle if no one's here by six o'clock, but hopefully you've still got some of these. Not a few <laughs> People should be wandering in and out. You can't see if the audience has gone to sleep. That's one good thing. <laughs> Very attentive. Um, so, I, actually, on that note, Andrew, what would you... Um, oh, another one. Hang on. Sorry. Yeah, I just got another question. So, it says, I have a Honda Civic. I'm, I'm not filtering these before I read them, so I probably should say that. <laughs> I have a Honda Civic Hybrid, and the battery had to be replaced after seven years. I wondered what happened to it and its hazards, hazardous content. With more electric cars coming online, is this... Uh, a, yeah, is it, is it a huge issue? Because she should ask Honda where it went. Because I tell you now, there's no recycling of electric vehicles properly in Australia yet. We're talking with a, a few manufacturers on doing it. But the big picture there just quickly is it's that lady's car or that man's car. I shouldn't say a Civic is a lady's car. Um, but you don't, the Honda are not responsible for that car after you buy it. So this is a huge issue in the um, energy, sto- energy storage and electric vehicle space is the ownership. So if you buy an electric car, it's now yours. If the if you crash it and it is written off, it's now the insurance company own it. So the manufacturer of that vehicle is not responsible for it through its life cycle. So this has to change and, and it is getting looked at, um, but it may mean we all have to lease the battery component of the car. So the ownership of that battery pack stays with the manufacturer, but currently it's not fair to blame the manufacturers either because of the system. Um, but really there should be some education around how that's working because that's only going to change if consumers say, no, no, I don't want to own, I'll own the car, but you own the battery pack. So you deal with it when it's finished and, and you manage the servicing and everything itself and you just lease it and give the battery pack at the end of life. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, I don't sound like a raving lefty, but seriously, it's up there with Coke saying that the plastic bottles are there. Um, um, drink comes in, um, aren't their responsibility. Yeah, well, so you bought it, so you own it. Apparently. <laughs> yeah, it's a different, different problem, right? Indeed. Yeah. Um, and Andrew, what would you leave us with? Um, the, the... Um, I have to get a better background for these video calls, is, is one. I've got nothing. It's all right, it's all good. Hopefully it, it, we get out of lockdown and I can have a park. You know, I think um, some of the other things to consider for recycling and, and for, you know, um, I guess a, a pretty common to a few industries is the brand protection. You know, maybe the way they make the product is, is seem to be unique in their eyes. So they, they don't necessarily like reuse. Um, so recycling is also good for that. Um, there's a few brands that we deal with that mainly really offer the take back to make sure that their material is not seen to be in a landfill site and they don't have that image of polluting the world. So that, that brand protection, one from, um, you know, the design and structure that goes into their product to that image of landfill sites with their waste in it, I think is becoming pretty powerful. And yeah, I, yeah, I think it's really, it, it's a responsibility of, of the users to, to manage the, the waste. It doesn't matter what it is. And, and I think the only way to do that is to really have better collection and, and we all have to somehow participate in that. And it, it, and it is difficult, but we're trying to work out a way that it, it can be feasible and, and attractive for people to do it, and companies to do it. Well, hopefully we've got one. <laughs> <laughs> the secret plan. Um, yeah. Thank you so much um, for your time. Oh, All right. 
Did, did you want to ask Andrew anything before we let him go? I'm not. Is that me? Yes, you can. Yes. So the incoming um, presenter gets to ask the outgoing one a question. Right, right. Yeah. All we'll day. Look, yeah. <laughs> but now to see if you were listening. Yeah, exactly right. Well, whilst I was on, on mute and um, no video was showing, I was actually in a conversation. So I probably wouldn't be very, it wouldn't be a very intelligent question I did ask. Uh, so I, I, I might pass on that if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, no, he's Thank established as honest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You could have been having dinner at this time too, was the other excuse. It's fine. No, I wasn't. I wasn't. I'm keen though. Yeah. <laughs> going around. It's going around. All right. Well, yes. Um, thank you again so much, Andrew. I, it's just, it's so enlightening. So we're on a mission to create with your mind minus out of everybody. Right. In um, every home in this country um, and to guard our shores to stop them leaving. Yeah, so, that's important. We, of course, um, will be in contact. Thank you just so much. It's just so Thanks, Jennifer, and thanks for putting today together. Hopefully, it's a, a success that you, you want. And, yeah, it's been fun to be a part of it. So thanks very much. Yeah, absolutely. We've learned a lot. And everyone from each other, actually. It's been really interesting, nice. um, which is what we want. It's a start. Yeah. It's a start. All right. Thank Good you. luck, James. Cheers, Andrew. Take thanks it easy on him. <laughs> I'm like something horrible is going to happen to me. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm getting nervous now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See you later. Bye. Bye.